I'm going to ask you to join me and let's pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the lives of each of those names that we have seen today, Father. We just ask that your Holy Spirit comfort in ways that only the Holy Spirit can. The folks that have lost loved ones, Jesus. We thank you for this wonderful place called heaven that you've given us where we know that we will spend eternal life with you, Lord. We thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, when he came to earth, told us that he would leave and prepare a place that we would go and we would be with him and join him uh, in celebrating through eternity the great relationship that we have with our Father. We thank you for this day that you have made, Lord. We ask you to bless it. We do ask you today to bless the reading uh, and the teaching of God's holy word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. How'd y'all like this, uh, this fall back thing? Did y'all like it? I don't know about y'all. I liked it. I loved it this morning. It's like I'm getting a whole extra hour, right? I mean, it was just great. I was, I was wondering if we could do that every week. I mean, just keep on falling back. I'd be good with it, right? Um, so uh, I, I, I want to say thank you to Craig who led worship today. If you had not gotten to meet Craig, it's just great to have him with us for a few weeks. Um, he's filling in. If you're visiting, he's filling in for Emily, who is our worship leader. I talked to Emily and Matt this week. Uh, they're, they're doing good. Little Brighton is doing well. He's had the Billy Blanket on. If you know what the Billy Blanket is, where they're like alien babies, where you try to get them right, you know, we had, we had that. So um, anyway, they are doing great. Um, said to tell everybody hello. So um, I, I'm going to jump into what we have for today because it's, um, it, it, it's probably kind of a long, but I think it's going to be a very informative sermon uh, and because um, there's a lot that we're covering. We're starting a three-week series on God's Word, on God's Holy Word. And so we're going we're gonna to do several things over the course of the next few weeks. Today we're going to talk about studying God's Word. Next week, we're going to talk about living God's Word. And then the third week, we're going to talk about the importance and the power of praying God's Word. And so um, a couple of things I want you to know I want to accomplish today. Number one, as we study God's Word, talk about studying God's Word, I want you to learn some of the basics about the Bible. So if you're old pros and you've been reading the Bible your whole life, you're going to go, man, Pastor, we already know all this stuff. Why are you, why are you telling us this? But if you are a, a new reader and a novice, I think that the things that I could tell you today may be very helpful and worth writing down. Especially want to encourage, do we have any confirmands that are in here today? Anybody going through confirmation, right? Y'all come on up, name the books of the Bible. I'm just kidding. No, y'all don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but I want you to pay attention because this may go along with some of the things that you're learning. Um, the second thing I want to do today is I want to encourage each of you to become a student of your Bible. You really need to become a student of your Bible, right? So the Bible tells us several things. It tells us that it's alive and active. The Bible tells us that it's living. The Bible says that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Um, it says, says it's inspired of God. The Bible tells us it can be used to teach, to rebuke. If you have children, listen, correct, and train in righteousness. So actually, we're all God's children. So the best way that I can explain it is the Bible is our instruction book for life. It is our instruction book. Last weekend, uh, our, uh, our, our dryer went out. Lord help us. So I had to go buy a washer and dryer. Got the package together. I thought I'd save about 50 bucks. So I told him, I said, I'll put it in myself. Had to be the man. So I go home, get it there, and try to put it in. And um, hooked everything up. I'm like, good to go. <laughs> right? And I, I hook it up and um, turn it on. I'm like, man, everything's going great until a puddle of water came out from underneath the washer. So what I'm saying is sometimes it helps to read the instructions. Some of us have puddles coming out of our life. It's because we haven't read the instruction book. Amen? So I want to encourage you to read this and to study it. That's why we're doing this series. So um, I thought that we would start off by talking about some of the mechanics of the Bible. And uh, this morning I brought my big Bible, right? We all like big Bibles, and we cannot lie. I'm not going there. But we all like big Bibles, right? The bigger your Bible is, the bigger your Bible is, the more holy you are. That's what they say. It's not the truth. So I'm going to use my big Bible this morning just because this is the one that I use to study and prepare sermons and things. I have several Bibles I use, but I'm going to start off by saying when I first, when I, when I got my first Bible, which was the third grade Bible, I just assumed that the Bible was all written by God. I just assumed it was all written by God, and God gave it to an angel, and the angel brought it down to some holy person. Maybe it was Moses. I don't know what I thought, and, um, and it was given to us, and so we had the whole thing. And I assumed um, that it was, it was all one author, all written at one point in time. And so I had a lot of comfort in knowing that God had given this to us. 
Well, I do believe that God has given us to us, given this to us, but the processes actually work quite different than that. The Bible is not a single work. The Bible is actually a collection of works. In fact, the Bible was written by, we think, around 40 different people, uh, 40 different authors. And uh, it, it's important for understand all these folks did not get together at the same time and write it. Uh, it was actually written over about a 1,500-year period, all the way back from 1400 B.C., uh, when the first five books of the Bible were written. We all know the first five books of the Bible, um, written by Moses, when the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness. God gave it to Moses. All the way up to around 90 A.D., when we have John, um, who uh, we believe wrote some of the last books of the Bible, as far as time periods. There's 66 books in the Bible, so 66 different books split into the what? Into the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Most of us know that. How many are, are there in the Old Testament? I want to shout it out. I have 39 books in the Old Testament. If you're good at math, how many do we have in the New Testament then? We, have, we need to work on our math. We have 27, 27 books in the New Testament. Really short in summary, just for you to know, um, the Old Testament focuses on the creation of the world. It focuses on the formation of God's people Israel. They're traveling into Exodus and coming out of it. And it really points us through the narrative and through all the prophets. It points us to the coming Messiah. The Messiah who would come to redeem and save God's people. That's the Old Testament. And then we get to the New Testament. And the New Testament focuses on the redemption of God's people through what? Through the death and resurrection of God's only Son, Jesus Christ. It tells us about his birth, it tells us about his life, it tells us about his teachings, and tells us about the spread of the gospel and the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. In fact, there's over 300 prophecies that are fulfilled in the New Testament that were said in the Old Testament. But most importantly, um, it's all about, the New Testament is all about through the life and death and resurrection of God's one and only Son that God came to redeem his people and established what we call a new covenant. So in the New Testament, we are under a new covenant, and that deserves an amen. 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 There you go. And then in the middle, what do we have in the middle between the Old and New Testament? Anybody know what's there? Just in the Old, between the Old and the New Testament, we have about a 400-year period time-wise. It's called the intertestamental period, and it's called the silent years. There's 400 years where nobody really heard from God. Some people say that we heard from God. We have this thing called the Apocrypha. Anybody heard of the Apocrypha? If you have a Catholic background, you may have grown up reading the Apocrypha, right? The Protestants don't claim that the Apocrypha is Scripture, but many of those books, uh, there are 14 books uh, that, that are included in this Apocrypha that we don't consider holy Scriptures for a number of reasons. I'll speak more to that in a little while. Um, but uh, those, some of those were written during the 400 period of silent years. And then at the end of the silent years, what happened? At the end of the silent years, we have this guy who's wearing camel hair and eating grasshoppers. His name is John. And John comes out of nowhere, and he breaks onto the scene, and he announces that who is coming, that Jesus Christ is coming. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up. If you have your phone, you can't really do this. That's why sometimes I encourage you to bring your Bibles. But if you have your Bible and you open it to the very middle, you'll find that the very middle of your Bible is actually Psalm 118. So that's Psalm 118, is the very middle. And some people have the question, they go, well, what's the middle verse? Well, we actually don't have a middle verse because there's an even number of verses in the Bible. Um, so there's, so there's actually 1,189 chapters in the Bible, 1,189 chapters in the Bible, but we don't, um, and, and I, think I, I think I wrote down the number of verses. Yeah, there's 31,102 verses, just out of curiosity. I'm sure you came to church wondering that today. 31,102 verses, even number of verses. So what I'm trying to tell you today is there's no middle verse. There's a middle two verses. You can highlight those if you want. Longest chapter in the Bible. Anybody want to shout out what it is? Do you know what it is? The longest, Psalm what? Psalm, Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. If you want to memorize that and recite it on Sunday morning, wouldn't have time for you to do that. I'm just kidding. I would love for you to do that. If you can take on Psalm 119. What's the shortest chapter in the Bible? Anybody know what it is? That's the shortest verse. I hear Jesus wept. Shortest verse. What's, the, what's the shortest chapter in the Bible? It's Psalm 117. Somebody said it. If you want to memorize it, I'll read it to you right now. It says, praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, 
and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. That's it. So if you memorize that, you can say that you memorized an entire chapter of the Bible. Longest verse in the Bible is Esther 8 and 9, and I'm not going to read it to you because it has lots of big words, but you can look that up. The shortest verse in the Bible is the one that somebody, a couple people yelled out, is that Jesus wept. So if you go to the front of your Bible, um, let's just talk for a minute about how all of the books were written down, um, how they kind of categorize them. The very front of your Bible, if you have what they call the table of contents. We know that we begin um, in your Bible with what we call the first five books of the Bible, which is what? It is the law. So I heard somebody yelling them out. You can say them with me. What are the first five books of the Bible? We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? If you've never read your Bible before, don't start with Leviticus. It's crazy. Um, <clears throat> this is what we call... Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Jews called it the Pentateuch or the Torah. It was written by Moses during his wanderings in the wilderness with the Israelites. Um, and we say that it was written by Moses, but the truth is, uh, if you look at Deuteronomy, I think it's like the last eight verses, couldn't have been written by Moses because it says, and Moses died. So I doubt Moses wrote, and Moses died. So I'm just telling you. Um, somebody had to add, the Jews believed that somebody added at least eight verses to the end of the Torah to include how Moses died. Um, after the law, the law of the Israelites in those first five books and how they're to live and how they're to behave and how they are to worship, then we have what we call the 12 historical books of the Bible. The 12 historical books, and I'll, I'll say them for you. It's Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. All these books were compiled um, at different uh, at different times, and uh, most of them from different authors, unless there's a one and a two. And most of the time, when there's a one and a two, when you have a first and a second, a lot of times people think, well, there was a, a, a first written, and then they came back and did an addition and did a second. But the truth is, it was all one book, and then we ended up splitting it into two for various reasons later on. So um, all the historical books, <clears throat> in short, tell the story of God's people and their occupation of going into, um, uh, or they're, they're going in and occupying Canaan, uh, all the way through the rise and fall of the northern, northern and southern, southern kingdoms, and then to the return and, and the re rebuilding of Jerusalem. So that's kind of the, 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 the summary of the historic books. So we have the law, we have the historical books, and then we have what we call the poetic books. So somebody yell out for me, what are the poetic books? What would, what would be included in the poetic books? Psalms, I heard Psalms. Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, the song of Solomon, right. I thought I'd give you a hint. I don't have a joke for all of them. And then, um, and then there was Job. It's Job, Job, right? The book of Job. You know somebody hadn't read their Bible when they did that, right? Kind of like people go to Bilo's and Walmart's. I'm always like, no, it's, we won't go there. But Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. These are all filled with great wisdom. Um, and great advice. In fact, one of the things I would suggest you do, if, if you're not a student of your Bible, you can go to Proverbs. Proverbs has how many chapters in it? It has 31 chapters, and I can't do the whole thing about January, February, March, whatever days. I can't do the 31-day thing, but a lot of the months have 31 days, some of them. So <clears throat> I'm just telling you, it would be cool to read one proverb a day for 31 days. If you read a proverb a day for the rest of your life, I guarantee you that you will be wiser than if you don't read a proverb every day for the rest of your life. So read the Proverbs. They're very, very helpful. So that's the five poetic books. So we have the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the law, the 12 historical books, the five poetic books. And then what do we have after that? Anybody know? <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hint um, that in just a minute, I'm going to tell you. Anybody get it? It's prophecy. Come on, just a minute, I'm going to tell you. Come on, y'all, I didn't even write these out. I think that's good. The prophetic books, 
right? So we have, we have 17 prophetic books, we have major prophets, and then we have minor prophets. Why do we have the major and minor prophets? We have the major prophets because they're more important, right? No, that's a joke. No, we have, they're called major because they're longer, and they're called minor because they're shorter. Not major because they're more important. That's what I used to think. So we have major prophets, we have minor prophets, and these prophets, all of them, um, are speaking God's message to God's people and pointing the way to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So that's your Old Testament. Now, what about the New Testament? How's the New Testament split up, Bible scholars? How is it split up? What do we start with? <clears throat> we start with the gospel. And what does gospel mean? The gospel means good news. Who's this, the good news of? It's the good news of Jesus. Jesus Christ comes into the world. And we have, who are the gospel writers? You can say them with me. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know that three of them were with Jesus, and three of them were eyewitnesses to some of the things that Jesus has done. And then we have Luke. And Luke, we know, Luke is a historian. And Luke actually goes back and he interviews people about all the things that people saw and witnessed um, who were with Jesus. And so we have uh, the four Gospels. And then we have 21 epistles. What's an epistle? An epistle is a letter. So we have 21 letters um, that are all about various things, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the building of the church, the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies, and most importantly, I love this part, the return of Jesus. And then finally, we have the book of Revelation. Revelation. And there's no S on the end. You ever hear people go, the book of Revelations? There's a lot of Revelations, but it's a book called the book of Revelation. And to describe what it is to you, it is its own book. It's the book of Revelation. But it is really all about futuristic and apocalyptic language. So that's the mechanics of the Bible in a nutshell. There's so much more that we could talk about, but I want to encourage you to become a student of it and become a student of how it works. Now, Here's the big question that I thought a lot of you would want to know this morning. You go, well, how was the Bible composed? How was the Bible put together if God didn't send an angel down to give the whole thing to us? Well, the best thing that I can do, uh, and I didn't bring it up here with me, I don't think. Yeah, I did. Um, is point you to a book. The best way that you can figure out how the Bible was, was built um, is read the book, How the Bible Was Built. Um, there, uh, Charles Merrill Smith um, is a United Methodist pastor who passed away and had some notes, and James W. Bennett comes back and actually finishes writing the book for him about how the Bible was built. I actually got this book from a group of guys in our church who were reading as a small group, and it actually goes through exactly how the Bible was put together. But what I want to tell you this morning, in a nutshell, is that forming the Bible was a process. It took lots of years, lots of debate, and lots of prayer. What had to happen is all 66 books in this Bible had to be considered Holy Scripture. They had to be what we call, have you ever heard the word canonized? They had to become part of the canon. Canon means read. Read means measuring rod. And so there was this long, drawn-out process of people deciding that these books were the Holy Word of God. Now, as far as the Old Testament, there's been very little debate that the first five books of the Bible uh, were considered Holy Scripture. Because they were written by Moses, right? I mean, Moses, you can't argue with Moses. I mean, nobody's going to argue with Moses. I mean, he, he's, you know, he's, he's in. Even Jesus credits Moses with writing the Old Testament. Jesus says in Mark 7, 10, he says, Have you not read in the book of Moses and in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him, saying, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? So Jesus quotes Moses as reading the Old Testament. And Jesus has a good bit of credibility, if you don't know that. So the first five books have not been argued about. Um, but we're really not sure how the whole Old Testament was put together. We're really not sure. We don't know when it was put together. We think it was put together somewhere around uh, two or 300 years before uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. What we do know, um, at some point, there was what we call the Septuagint. If you've heard of the Septuagint, it's, um, it was the uh, 
Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So the people who couldn't speak Hebrew, um, there was a formation of this thing that was a Hebrew Bible written in Greek. And we know that they had that somewhere around the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, once again, before you fall asleep, let me tell you this. Um, and I don't want to get into all the weeds, but I will say this about the New Testament. It took around 300 years for the New Testament to be put together as you're holding it in your hands today. The first compilation of the New Testament canon, we think, was somewhere around 170 A.D., although that's a little bit controversial. But some form of the New Testament, some of the books were put together and called the canon uh, somewhere around 170 A.D., what I will tell you, if you read this book uh, and other books, um, you will find that there were a series of councils that were, head, were held, and some of you may have heard of these, uh, Council of Rome, Council of Hippo, Council of Carthage, Council of Laodicea. They were all uh, in the 3rd and 4th century A.D. All those councils got together and argued and debated over many years about which books should be included as scriptures. Now there were some books in here that they didn't think needed to be in the scriptures, that some people wanted to argue should not be holy scriptures. Some of those books would include the book of James, the book of Hebrews, first and second Peter, and imagine this, Revelation. It's probably because nobody knew how to interpret it. Um, but uh, in the Apocrypha, we mentioned the Apocrypha, once again, uh, I had a Bible that I studied when I was in divinity school that in between the Old Testament and the New Testament had the Apocrypha. I didn't know what the Apocrypha was. Started reading it and realized that it was um, a series of some 14 books that were um, debated about whether or not they should be in the Bible. In fact, they were in the Bible until a man named Martin Luther. Ever heard of him? Any Lutherans in here? Ever heard of Martin Luther? Martin Luther came along, and Martin Luther didn't think that the scriptures needed to be included in all the other scriptures. And so what he did was he stuck them between the Old and the New Testament. And somewhere throughout history, we just decided as Protestants to go ahead and pull all those out. Martin Luther thought enough not to include them in the rest of the scriptures. Obviously, there's more debate, and we just took them out altogether. So, I know some of you are thinking, I'm crazy right now. You're thinking, what are you talking about? Go read the Apocrypha. It's really interesting. But let me tell you this. Um, some of the questions that were asked at each of the councils about putting the Bible together, here's some of the questions that were asked to consider whether or not the book should be canonized. Question number one, was the author an apostle? In other words, were they with Jesus, and did they see Jesus, and did they have a close connection, or did they have a close connection with an apostle? Number two, was the book being accepted by the body of Christ at large? In other words, was, was the body at that time considering it to be Scripture? Remember, folks, I'll remind you this. There was no printing press, right? There, I mean, we think about today and we're like, man, I don't understand. Why was it so confused? There was no printing press. So you couldn't just put a book together and mass send it out to everybody. People were writing things on scrolls. People were writing things on stone. And, and people were passing things down orally. Right? Remember? Let I me mean, just take yourself back there. Remember, this isn't today. You've got to remember that. Um, number three, does the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? And then number four, does the book bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect a work of God's Holy Spirit? So they ask a series of these questions. Um, they put the books. They got it together as you have it. Later on, they went and added chapters and verses. Hadn't always had chapters and verses. That's for us and for our reference to talk about it. So I've said a lot this morning, and some of you may be utterly confused. Some of you may go, I'm never reading the Bible again, because that sounds so confusing and crazy. But it is the truth of how the Holy Scriptures are put together. Now, so here's what I want to say as I wrap this up. Here's what I want to ask you this morning. If that is the case, and it's such a long history, why in the world should we read the Bible? Why in the world should we read it? Why would I trust this book if it's been put together by broken men, some 40 authors over a period of 150 years, 66 different books? Why in the world would I trust it? And here's what I want to say to you this morning. I believe with all of my heart that it was God's Holy Spirit that wove this book together and that knitted it together. I believe that God used broken people and broken sinners just like you and I, like he does every day in the church, to put together his holy word. There's no way, there's no way, I was thinking about this week, there's no way that this book, if you are a student of this 
this book, and you read it from the beginning to end. If you read it all the way from Genesis, read through the law, read through all the poetry, read especially through the prophets, and then you read the New Testament and see how much it is intertwined and how much the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. There is no way that you can tell me that God was not working and weaving the Holy Spirit in and out of the process of this whole book putting together. The works of the Bible have been threatened time and time again by dictators, and they've been threatened by war. And people have tried to destroy the book. They've tried to defame the book. They've tried to make it illegal. They've tried to put it into languages that people can't read. And God's holy word continues to remain and stay the same. Amen? It is good stuff. And yes, there were other writings. There were other letters that were considered to be part of the book. Think about the Apostle Paul. How many letters did the Apostle Paul write? He didn't just write 12 or 13 letters. He wrote tons of letters. Think about Jesus. How much more life did Jesus live? I mean, Jesus lived 33 years. It's not like you just got a little story. I mean, there could be chapters and chapters about Jesus, but I believe that God was working to put the book together by broken people. Think about this. What we have right now in that book is we have a book written down, documentation by people who walk with Jesus. Matthew was a disciple. He wrote a book of the Bible. Mark was a disciple. He wrote a book of the Bible. Luke wasn't with Jesus, but he interviewed everybody who was. John, the apostle who sat and ate with Jesus at the Last Supper, wrote a book. Peter, who walked on water, wrote a book. Paul, who experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus, lost his sight and regained it, wrote 12 letters or 13 letters of the Bible. It's debatable. The first five books of the Bible were written by a man who followed God into the wilderness with all of God's people. We have the book of Proverbs, which is from one of the wisest men who ever lived except for the fact that he married 700 women. (laughs) This is our book. This is our story. It's where we came from, and it is where we are headed. And as Christians, believers who have gone before us, who have prayed and hit their knees, have sought to put this book together. And people have fought and died to defend the book. And here's what I have to say to you today. I believe with all my heart that it is holy and sacred. And I believe the same God who led Israel through the wilderness and brought them into the promised land could certainly steer a bunch of broken individuals in developing a book. There's one scripture I chose for the day, and it comes from Joshua 1.8, and it says this. And remember, this is Joshua referring to the first five books of the Bible, but I take it as referring to all the books. It says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. Always keep it on your lips and meditate on it day and night, and you will be successful. This book sitting on this table is the living word of God. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but shall live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, said all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Something happens when we read God's word, folks. It begins to change our life. I started reading this book when I was 12 years old. I remember I opened it up. Our house had just burnt down. Felt like we really had nothing. And I started reading it daily as a kid. And I remember being so confused by some of the books in there going, what in the world is this talking about? But it started to change my life. And over the years, as I've continued to read it, and I've gotten more and more knowledge about it, it seems like the more I read it, the more I believe that this is truly the living Word of God. And it is woven together by the Holy Spirit. You might be asking today, you go, well, that's great, but I haven't been studying it my whole life, so where do I begin? If you don't know where to begin studying this, I want to encourage you to open one of the Gospels this week. Uh, I would suggest the Gospel of Mark would be a good place to begin because it's short and it's quick, and it's almost like Mark's trying to hurry up and write it because he believes that Jesus is coming back. I would suggest starting with Mark, maybe then Genesis, the story of where you began and I began. Um, I'm going to invite the band up here, but as they're making their way up here, here's what I would say to you. You know, a lot of us are hurting, and we feel like we need direction, and we feel confused in life, um, and we seek out a lot of advice from a lot of people. 
don't know about you, but I, sometimes I'm, I'm asking people what they think I should do with my time and my energy and my money or whatever. Um, but I would suggest this morning, maybe you let God's word speak truth into your life. Instead of listening to what everybody else has to say, I mean, certainly God gives us people of confidence and character in our life, but I would suggest you first turn to God's word. So if you're struggling today and you had a problem in your life, I want to just encourage you to open up the word that God gave us. I'd suggest that you let the Bible be the scales to weigh between right and wrong. Let the book guide you. Fall in love with the book. Read it daily and it'll change your life. What I'm going to do this morning is um, I'm going to ask our prayer teams if, if they would go to their respective places. And uh, this morning, maybe you just need prayer about, I don't know, whatever going on in your life. But I also want to offer to you if you want to um, be prayed over about the renewing of your faith and excitement in reading the scriptures. So that's a prayer that you would like to receive. Um, I just, you ask our prayer teams if they pray a special prayer for you. And I just ask that next week you come back um, and you bring your Bible with you as we continue to study it. I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us your precious word, Lord, and I ask for forgiveness in the moments that we doubt and we question um, life without turning to the true word of God, which has the answers. Uh, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you took broken people uh, and they through their work, Lord, and through you in them, wove together this great book that we have that tells the story of where we came from and where we're going. And Father, most of all, thank you for Jesus Christ, who was the living word of God. Thank you that we have the stories about him, um, the miracles. Uh, we have the truth in this word, Lord. I pray that we protect it and we defend it um, and that we live according to it and don't doubt it, Lord. Uh, thank you so much for this precious gift. We just love you, Lord. Lord, I ask today if somebody in here is just struggling that they are unafraid to come forward and receive prayer today, Father. Um, they don't want to get up out of their seat. I just pray that your Holy Spirit speak to them in their seat and comfort them and help them with what they're struggling with. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.